So I would also like to introduce you all to Manage Engine. I'm sure that most of you know who, who we are, but for those who are not very familiar with who we are and what we do, Manage Engine is uh, the enterprise IT management division for uh, Zoho Corporation. And we have a whole bunch of products in the in real time IT management uh, spectrum, including uh, you know analytics, uh, uh, IT service management, endpoint management, and so on. So Manage Engine has been positioned in the Gartner's Magic Quadrant uh, for ITSM tools this year as well, which is a second uh, uh, second year in a row. So if you're interested in knowing more about the Ga uh, Gartner's Magic Quadrant. Uh, we have added a link in the handout section for you to download the report. Please go ahead and check that out. So we also have a network of uh, global partners who have joined us uh, in our journey to help organizations around the globe uh, tightly align their business and IT. So if you're interested in knowing more about Manage Engine, please do visit our website at manageengine.com. And Manage Engine's flagship IT service management uh, product or solution is Service Desk Plus. It's uh, available as both on-premises and uh, cloud versions. And it's a full stack IT SIM suite with uh, all the industry recommended IT SIM processes uh, with native and third party integrations. So if you're interested in Service Desk Plus, please do check us out at uh, servicedeskplus.com. So without any further waiting, let's hear from Peter. I'm going to transfer the session over to him. Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, attending this uh, uh, short session talking about the service desk. Um, and the particular important point about the service desk is the contribution to value. So um, not just measuring the service desk technically, but understanding what it really does for an organization in terms of, of value. So the first thing is the service desk is really, really crucial. As far as most users are concerned, they only really have two interactions uh, with an, an organization. One, a service provider organization. One is using a service and the other is contacting the service desk. So the view, the understanding, the experience that the users get using the service desk is crucial for them to understand and um, have um, a view of the value of your organization. Value, as it says, is the perception. Value is the perception of benefit that all stakeholders have. But for the service desk, the uh, stakeholders who are most concerned with the service desk are, of course, the users. Now, if they do not have a good experience with the service desk, they will not perceive their service having the same value as if they do have a good experience. Now, of course, we know the various difficulties with this. One is whenever somebody's calling the service desk, they are calling because they need something. Quite often because there's been an incident, something is broken and something is down, so they are not having a good day. Sometimes they're asking for a service request, which is less high stress. But often people calling the service desk are already not having a good experience. So it's really important that the service desk is able to turn that around and enable them uh, to have a good experience. So that when they finish the call, they do have a perception that they have um, achieved the benefit from that call. What you need to do, and all of the things I'm talking about here are going to be useful things that you can think about doing with your, um, your service desk. But remember that these are not things that you would go and do immediately because that will be very disruptive and perhaps reduce the value that you're delivering. It's a good idea to plan this as a continual improvement exercise. So wherever you are at the moment, understand where you are understand where you'd like to be and plan the improvement from the one place to the other. The two things though that you're trying to improve are what I've just been talking about, the user experience, how users actually experience the whole um, interaction with you, the whole touch point between them and the service desk from beginning to end, and the overall results, the outcomes for users and customers. So that goes a bit further than just the service desk. It gets involved with things like problem management because 
however good the experience that you have talking to the service desk, if you end up with your service not being restored, you're not going to be happy. So it is necessary, as well as what we're going to be talking about, to, to have the background um, work going on to provide workarounds and solutions in order to make sure that you do have the outcomes people require. We'll talk more about outcomes in a little while. So that's the background. When we are measuring things, and metrics, of course, is just way, one way of, of describing uh, a measure, one of the big distractors, one of the really difficult things about it is that a lot of things are very easy to measure. I mentioned some. How long does a call last? Um, how many calls are backed up in the queue? How long does it take to resolve an incident? Uh, how many users call in a day? These are all very easy things to measure. Often your service desk software is just going to measure them automatically. Now, there's nothing wrong with having those measures to inform you about things. So you can know, well, if the queue of people trying to call is going up, it means that you know, you're not handling things, you're under capacity, you need to do something about that. So those metrics are certainly important, but it's really important not to measure how well you're delivering the customer experience just based on those metrics. What you need to understand is how well you are as an organization, as an entity, satisfying the users. Now, short calls may be a great value to users. Long calls may be value to other users. Some users will get uh, more satisfaction out of discussing it, getting a proper understanding. Others would like it to be dealt with as quickly as possible in terms of the discussion. The service desk needs to be sensitive to that and not simply say, well, this was not good because it was quick or this is not good because it took too long. It's got to understand what the quality is in order to satisfy the end user. In order to understand what the end user is trying to get, you need to understand what the outcomes are for your stakeholders. Now, one stakeholder is, of course, the customer. The customer has to define the requirements for the overall service, including the service levels and so forth, how long the service is, is, can be down for, how quickly it should be recovered. So understanding those outcomes for customers are important, but also understanding what outcomes the users are requiring. How quickly do they need things to be resolved? What are they actually trying to do in their job? If a user is trying to achieve something and your service is blocking that person doing it, you're, you are actually reducing the value that that user is having. So you need to understand what the user is trying to do so that you can resolve the outcome rather than resolving the problem. The, the classic example of this is, is um, if a printer goes down, uh, if a system is, uh, if a service desk is not concerned with uh, outcomes, it might just say, oh, all right, we'll fix the printer. But that doesn't resolve the issue, especially if it's going to take a long time. That person is trying to print something in order to take it to an important meeting. So uh, to resolve that, it would be far better to redirect the printout to another printer. So the, the, the actual service, the outcome that's required, which is uh, having a, a printout, going to a, a meeting and having everything that you need is satisfied and not just that the thing is fixed. So already we know this, that we're trying to um, work towards outcomes, but it's important with all of your services and all of your stakeholders to have a better idea of what the outcomes are going to be. Because if you understand the outcomes, you can understand what user experience is required in order to achieve those outcomes. It's not going to be the same for everybody. Some parts of the business are going to require extremely quick turnaround. They're, they're going to be very much under time pressure and you need to respond to that. Other parts of the organization are going to find it more difficult to work with things and will need more of a contribution in terms of knowledge transfer, for example. It's important to understand the different outcomes that you're going to achieve. Now, understanding these outcomes means that you need to understand your stakeholders quite well, not just at the, at, at the level of your overall um, service provider, but people at working at the service desk need to understand what the different outcomes are for their different users and what the customers behind that are needing to have. 
So ultimately what you're trying to do in the next one on the right is to get a good customer experience. So the customer requirements, the customer outcomes, the customer value is delivered. The way in which you're going to achieve that customer experience is by giving the users a good user experience. Now, if you as an employee, as somebody at the service desk, don't understand what the outcomes are and don't know who the stakeholders are, don't understand the different user groups, different user communities and what they're requiring, then you're not going to be able to help them. And if you as a service desk agent are finding it difficult to operate, the tools you've got are not good, you're under lots of pressure, you haven't had um, training in order to understand that when people call and they're unhappy, they're not complaining about you, they're actually concerned about the system being down and you need to take away that uh, feeling that, that uh, you are being attacked by people. All sorts of these things are connected with a good employee experience. And that employee experience will come from your more uh, long-term, more engaged employees. So let's carry on. We'll come back to that a little bit more later on. Now, in order to achieve this, to have good employee experience, so your employees are effectively um, in the flow, they are working with your um, stakeholders, they're understanding the users, they're understanding what the users are doing, they're able to concentrate on that, they're not being distracted by uh, other things, you need to have really good management of your service desk in order to make sure it is looking after the employees at the service desk properly. So it's not a matter of just getting good service desk agents. It's a matter of making sure that the management of the service desk is managed, it is really good. Of course, when you're managing the service desk, you're also it's also part of the overall governance of the organization the way in which the organization wishes to proceed, its policies, its objectives, its vision, and you need to understand that and integrate that into what you're doing at the service desk. So if there is a new direction, for example, the service desk agents are aware about that and where it is relevant, able to communicate that to the users. So engaged management is making sure that the service desk agents are fully aware of the current situation, what, what the governance of it is, and who the stakeholders are. Now let's have a look at some examples of metrics that can help us understand whether we're doing a good job. Remember, if we've got new employees that haven't been long in the job, they are not going to understand these things. They're not going to be up to speed. If we have employees that are unhappy and that they feel under a huge amount of pressure, they feel that they're being attacked by people, they feel that they can't cope with the job, or they feel a job is really boring because they're having repetitive calls all the time, any of these reasons can mean that staff feel under stress and you can get burnout. So one clear thing is if you have high staff turnover at your service desk, you are not doing well because you've got new employees all the time who are not trained, who don't understand your organization. So as high staff turnover, is a, it's a bad indicator because it means it's actually, it's a, um, a lagging indicator. It's telling you that you've being a, been doing a bad job for the last whatever period it is, and it's not so helpful for the future. One that's slightly less bad, but is useful in current status is uh, how often people are away, how often they are ill, how often they're out of the office, uh, how often there is uh, employee downtime. Because if people are happy and engaged, they're normally there working. If people are under stress, then they tend to get ill more. So if you have a level of absenteeism that's higher than your, your company average, that's an indication that your service desk agents are under too much pressure. Again, that's a bit of a lagging indicator. You don't want them to get to that stage. So it's a good idea to make sure you measure employee satisfaction clearly. Often it's important to make sure that you have an external third party doing that measurement so that it's anonymous, so that you know you're really getting the real information about what the employees are, fit, are feeling. Again, job interest. Are you keeping a new, you can uh, find this out in the same surveys, not just are they satisfied, but how interesting is the job? Do they find that they are uh, getting good training? Do they find that they are getting more interesting things to work on? Do they enjoy the engagement with, with customers? Because these are the things that actually really motivate human beings. 
If you're not getting on with customers, if you're under lots of stress, if the job is very repetitive and, and um, you're not getting changes because they're not fixing the underlying problems, you are going to find it boring. Anybody is, and they're therefore going to find that their interest in the job and their ability to do it is to going to go down. Stress measures. Now, I, I mentioned automated measurement. This is something that's only just becoming possible now. But um, if you have high stress levels at your service desk, those will be communicated to the callers. It's just the way human beings are. If callers are already in a state of stress because they've, something's gone wrong and they're calling people who are under stress, the two are going to multiply each other and they are going to have a bad experience together. And at the end of the call, even if it's resolved, they're not going to feel that they've had a good experience and they won't enjoy calling the service desk. Now, you could measure in people's voice the level of stress. So it is these days technically possible. I mean, there may be questions about um, whether it is um, ethically possible. And of course, the stress level should not be used to measure people. You're under stress. You're doing the wrong thing. Uh, obviously, that would be really bad. But if you have an idea of the aggregate level of stress at your service desk and see that going up, that's an indication that they're under too much pressure or that you're not getting enough things resolved or there's not enough slack built into your, your, your system and so forth. So having a, a, a picture, a sort of a live picture of how stressed things are is a good indicator. Obviously, you'd expect at busy times like Monday mornings, the stress level would be a bit higher, but within manageable levels. Job satisfaction, that's not just job interest, that's overall, do they feel their promotion prospects? Are service desk agents promoted to be, uh, come service desk um Managers, do they have other career paths in your organization? Uh, does the overall job satisfy them? This is also going to be, in the long term, a measure of how well they're going to be able to contribute to the service desk. Outcome measures, in terms of your calls, I've mentioned already, you need to know what value is being lost to your customers. So the service desk knows how well it is supporting that. So. If somebody calls and it's a minor issue and they're able to resolve it, they know that they've done a good thing for that user, um, but it's just affecting one user. If, on the other hand, there's a major outage and they've managed to deal with a number of users who are having a great deal of difficulty, they can, they've managed to get them back quickly, uh, reassure them everything is okay and the users are all happy, that, because it's a number of users and a length of time and possibly an important service, is a really great victory. They have turned around what would have been a really negative experience for their customers into a positive one. Now, the users uh, obviously will be delighted with that, but the service desk agents need to know that. They need to be aware, look, we really have contributed something of value and they need to be told and congratulated and thanked because that is the satisfaction you have as a service desk agent that you've helped people. And if you just fix calls all day and nothing comes back apart from the odd happy sheet, you don't really realize what you're doing for the organization. So it's a good idea to measure this. And whenever there's a great contribution, you know, uh, out of the ordinary good, uh, report on that to the employees so they get more satisfaction. For the customers, you need to understand what you're doing in the medium and long term. So are you helping the users, not just with things that go down in the short term, but in managing um, to deal with things in the long term, uh, over time as they are progressing? Now, what I've just been talking about has all been from the point of view of making sure that your users and customers get a good service from the agents working at the service desk. In order for them to do that job, they need to be managed effectively. Their managers need to be removing blocks. Now, this is part of the, the idea, uh, and it's really becoming a pervasive idea of, of good governance, is that you have what they call um, servant leadership, where the overall leaders of the organization realize their job is to help the organization do things, not to tell them to do things, uh, not, not to criticize them when they haven't done them, but to lead by enabling people. And the way you enable people is you give them the power to do things and you remove blocks in the way of them being able to achieve the things that they need to achieve. 
service desk managers need to have a very clear idea of what the outcomes required by all their uh, stakeholders are. Now, normally, the main stakeholders they'll be thinking about will be the users, and that's completely reasonable. They are the main stakeholders of the service desk. They're the people that call. But they also need to be con concerned about the customers because it's all very well keeping the users happy, but if the users are not moving in a direction that the customers are wanting them to go, and this is why it's important that the service desk agents have a good understanding of the governance and management and the outcomes that are required, it's not going to help. So, for example, if your um, customer is wanting the users to get used to a new application, because that application has been designed to, contrib to contribute new value. And when they call the service desk, the service desk says, oh, well, if you run into difficulty, you could just do this on the old system. Now, that would be the service desk moving the opposite direction to the direction the customer wants to go, because they're asking users to, to giving users the impression that the old service is superior to the new one, and the new one is not really working, and they can use the old one. Now, it might be, I'm not saying this will always be the wrong thing to say, but what's important is that the service desk agents are aware that the aim is to migrate people to the new system and are aware, aware that if they ask people to move back to the old system, that is moving against the customer value, even if it's, if it's contributing short-term value to the users. Now, if you understand all those things, you can communicate it in a way that's effective, not, oh, this service doesn't work, it's not really good, this new service, you can use the old service, but something more along the lines with, well, look, the new service will do it, but I understand that you're in a hurry, you're familiar with the old system at the moment, so why not just this morning, since it's Monday, use the old service that you're familiar with, and then I'll arrange for you to have... Um, uh, access to uh, um, a video, say, about how the new system does that. Or you can talk to one of the uh, people who are doing the training on the new system, and you can understand how to use it in the new system. So instead of it being positioned as a flaw with the new service, the user can understand it as being um, uh, a learning experience to get to know the new service. Now, I know that seems a subtle difference, but in terms of the overall effect on the outcomes that the customer has had, that is going to be large. And there are, I mean, I'm mentioning one that may be a fairly obvious one. In everyday operation, you're going to find lots of different areas where subtle adjustments to the way in which you work are going to provide major differences to how the customers perceive the overall experience. Now, yet again, if your service desk is under stress and their only objectives is let's just get this call out of the way because there isn't time to do more, they're just going to say use the old system. They're not going to add that extra bit to guide people to uh, working on um, the new system. So what you need to make sure is that the employee experience is good that they are feeling comfortable, they're not feeling under too much stress or too much pressure, so they can think about the stakeholder outcomes. If they are in that space where they have are having a good employee experience, they're relaxed, they're not feeling under attack, they're not feeling under too much pressure just to close the call, they can concentrate on that good, proper, holistic user experience. If they can do that, they can get a good custo customer experience, and that means that your overall stakeholder experience is high. So the job for managers, you can see here, is to communicate effectively to the employees exactly what the outcomes are for different services, for different customers, and help the service desk agents achieve the outcomes that are being required by different customers. Now, this is a different level of communication from simply saying, answer the call in so long, and this is the technical thing, and this is where your workarounds are. It's engaging your service desk agents in the actual production of experience. Now, this the great thing about this is this is actually a virtuous circle as opposed to a vicious circle. A vicious circle, everything you do makes things wrong and they in turn make other things wrong. This is a virtual, uh, uh, sorry, a virtuous circle because 
as service desk agents are able to contribute better to good customer and good user experience, they are going to feel better about their job and how they, the satisfaction of their job, which is, means, in turn, feeling more satisfied with their job, they will be able to do more of it and contribute more of it. So service desk managers need to be encouraging and um, collaborating with the service desk agents to ensure that they're seeing, recognizing, and understanding the satisfaction of resolving the real um, issues, which are, as I say at the bottom, the outcomes and value that you are trying to establish for your stakeholders. Outcomes, of course, are the actual results that you're going to get. Value is the perception of the results that you're going to get. Now, I just emphasize that a, a little bit more, that the outcome for users from a successful call to the service desk is that if something has gone wrong, it's restored and they can carry on working. That's the straightforward, simple result. But the actual genuine outcomes are that they get their morning's work done, that they are able to talk to their customers, they're able to process their invoices, whatever it is that they're doing, effectively without too much extra stress because something has gone wrong. So the actual outcomes is how well did they work that morning? Did they achieve what they were trying to do that day? Were they able to satisfy their customers? So the kind of questions you would be asking your users is not how long did it take to resolve the call, but on Monday, you gave us a call. Was Monday a good day for you? Were you able to achieve your objectives that day? Were there any things that stopped you doing your job that day that could have helped in some way? And if they're finding that it took too long, that it was the, the, the way that the, the, the um, service was restored was too disruptive, that, that it, it interrupted their day too much, those are all indications they're not getting the outcomes that they require. It's not enough for the service desk simply to resolve the incident, simply to provide the um, service request. In order to get value, in order to get a perception of benefit, you need to make sure that your users actually do better at what they're doing in their job. So think entirely of the outcomes. So for each service, what is this service enabling our users to do? What are our customers trying to achieve with that particular service? When it goes wrong, when we have to resolve an incident, what is it that um, stops them doing things? How can workarounds help? Of course, workarounds are important. But more than that, are there ways in which you can help and coach people to get more value and use out of the service even when things have gone down? So it may be that if somebody is working on something and they have achieved a particular uh, result and then something goes wrong, instead of simply saying, well, look, we'll fix a thing that goes wrong, you might be able to guide them and say, well, actually, now you've got that far, you could just do this and achieve the same result if you understand what outcomes they are trying to achieve. So rather than just using a standard workaround for a particular outage, you can begin to understand what the users are trying to do, what the customers are needing done, and help guide them towards that. Now, in that case, the real value is that you're actually then providing benefits in achieving the results that your customers are wanting to achieve by ensuring that your um, users achieve the results that they're trying to achieve. Now, I think you can see that this is quite a long way ahead of where we normally are with the service desk. Normally with a service desk, if we are able to just fend off the incidents and deal with the service requests, we feel that you know we're doing a pretty good job. But I hope that this gives an idea of the next stage that we should be trying to achieve. And service desk managers ought not to be judged on incidents, problems, outage, that kind of thing, but should be judged on what we're talking about here. What outcomes for the stakeholders have been facilitated by the service desk? What are the employee experiences at the service desk? What have the user experiences been? 
what have the customer experiences been? Now, to work out those uh, employer, user, and customer experiences uh, in detail, you'll also need to have some understanding of the journeys. So when we're talking about stakeholder outcomes and user outcomes, we need to understand more about what the user journey is and what the customer journey is, not just the journey through the service provider, but the journey through their handling their work. So you need to understand what they are trying to do so when there are blockages and what they are trying to do, you can help break those blockages. And this is what the managers are going to be working at. So looking at the service desk agents, resolving calls that come in, seeing where those calls are helping guide the users in the right direction, provide extra value, and then communicating those solutions to other people in the service desk. So it becomes a collaborative exercise. So when one service desk agent discovers something, oh, wow, this user was trying to do this and they couldn't do it. We spoke about it and I was able to suggest this other option that experience of that uh, um, service desk agent should be quickly communicated to everybody else. Look, here is a way that we can add extra value by uh, encouraging our users to do this. And uh, if everybody else can do that in similar circumstances, we can achieve something. And that way, you've now given the service desk agent praise for having come up with this new thing, which is going to improve that service desk uh, agent's job satisfaction. But you also are always getting improvement information, continual improvement suggestions back from the interactions based on the stakeholder outcomes. And again, this is a virtuous cycle. So concentrating on stakeholder outcomes, considering the stakeholder experience, using that in order to build service desk agent satisfaction by concentrating on the outcomes and value goes back to the beginning of encouraging good stakeholder outcomes. And as servant leaders, you can see the managers are behind this exercise always redefining and refining and understanding the outcomes, working hard to monitor and measure the employee experience, and then cons consequent user and uh, customer experience, then understand how satisfied service desk agents are, and not just in a negative way. I mentioned before, you know, things like absenteeism and staff turnover. Those uh, measures should be there, but they should be receding right into the background. Because if you work through this virtuous cycle with uh, leader managers enabling this uh, cycle, you are likely to end up with um, low levels of absenteeism and very low levels of um, customer dissatisfaction. Okay. Um, we have one question that's come in. Uh, can you see it on the questions tab? Uh, share the presentation. Uh, no, uh, there's one unanswered that says one might add to causes of stress a situation where the supported systems are not well designed to be easily supportable. Might not absolutely, one. absolutely, 100%. I agree. And because I've been thinking about the, the service desk particularly, I've not been looking and talking so much about the back end. I mentioned a little bit with, with problem management that, uh, you know, you, you need to have problem management operating to take away common causes so that you don't end up with people just dealing with the same old incidents every single day. If there are many repeated incidents, you find out why they're there and you remove the underlying reasons. But definitely usability and design, design for support and design for usability are absolutely crucial. And the service, and this is another part of the job satisfaction of service desk agents, actually, um, they ought to be involved very early on in the design process of new applications, new um, services, uh, even when they're going to be upgrades to services and they're going to be new features, the service desk agents ought to be involved in that process so they can understand the supportability of it from their perspective. I, I mean, just a simple one. I, I, I'm thinking about uh, something like uh, the difference between uh, streaming services online. There's Netflix and there's uh, Amazon Prime and the various other ones. And what I notice about some of them is that their user experience is nice and simple. You push your finger in the middle of the screen and up it comes with pause, go back 10 seconds or come forward 10 seconds. 
Now, when you have that, you very seldom get it wrong. Some of the other ones have a, a bar at the bottom, and if you click on them, you can, by mistake, instead of clicking pause, you can click on the, 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 the um, con continuity line and have the film jump back to the beginning just by missing the, the right thing. Now, people at the service desk having calls will be aware of exactly those issues. If you place those buttons too close together, you're going to start getting issues. And that's why service desk agents should be involved with design decisions so that they can just point out, say, look, all of our users, whenever you do this, you put things that close together or you do that, they start having issues. They should understand and know about them well enough and put them into the design process. Absolutely crucial. And they should be consulted for it. And this is part of the vir uh, vir uh, virtuous cycle as well, because if your service desk agents are taken seriously enough to be actually involved in the proper design process and see their recommendations coming about, that is an enormous con contribution to um, your job satisfaction. Because you feel not only are the things that make the job easier for the users being done, but things that I am seeing and I am recommending are actually improving what we're doing in the long-term future. It's brilliant. Thank you. That's an excellent question. If that's the only question that we have, that's a really good one. Thank you. Uh, definitely, definitely, definitely. Uh, having a service desk involved in design, brilliant. There's a uh, chat that's come in. 100% um, agree with SD participation in the business roadmap. I'd like to see SD participation in all planning boards from business strategy, project management, and software development and deployment. People do often understand just how much insight the SD holds about the way the business works. Absolutely. Thank you very much. 100%. I'm, I'm with you. The, the uh, involvement of I mean, I think rotation is, if it's possible, and it's not always possible in all organizations, but rotation of people, uh, especially um, junior people in the organization, is a really good thing. So they can work at the service desk for a week, few weeks or a, a month and understand it. Maybe work in another department for a few months and begin to understand it. And developing a wider appreciation of the business over time is really crucial. But yes, as you say, specific involvement with planning, with design, is absolutely crucial to good design, but also it feeds back into the um, overall employee satisfaction. And I can't emphasize enough. I mean, I, just as a, an example, I, I work with one organization, it was a telecoms organization, and they had an absolutely terrible time with their customers. And I went along and I discovered that they had their service desk in the basement, in the dark, with everybody in little hen coops. And it was noisy and it was hot and it was oppressive. And I thought, now, if I was in this room for an hour, I wouldn't be able to help people. I'd be feeling... Anyway, what happened was they did have a new person. They changed things. And I came back about a year later. And they had moved on to something like a second floor. They'd got plenty of natural light a nice view outside. Um, they had got um, all of the people not in their individual little thing as if they were, they were in a prison cell, but in groups of four. So they could easily turn around and discuss things. And what I like particularly about it, and this is what made me really realize it was a good, um, uh, good situation, was that up on the board, they had um, competition between the different teams but it wasn't a, a negative competition. It was, you know, achievements. This team's achieved this. This team's achieved that. They're trying to achieve the other. And also, what I liked about it, I happened to be there around this time of year, and they had, um, you know, little things up uh, hanging from the ceiling and so on for Halloween, which made me feel, I mean, okay, you can say that's frivolous, but I felt it meant to me that those service desks agents felt comfortable with each other. They felt comfortable in that environment, comfortable enough to have a little bit of fun and feel that it was okay uh, to enjoy that uh, while they were at work. And I think those are the type of outcomes leader managers should be looking for. Um, I know it sounds sort of vague, having people comfortable where they work, but somebody sitting down in the basement in one of those things is the opposite. 
And what you're trying to achieve is something where people actually get pleasure, enjoy their, their work. And uh, I mean, obviously, I know these days a lot of people will be working from home, and it's 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 a challenge to get the same kind of integration there. But again, you need to actually make an effort to talk to people and have them talk to others to try and, and build that. Thank you. That's a nice one too. We have another one. Um, understanding desired user outcomes can be very difficult when the users are large in number and are external to the supplier organization. Do you have any suggestions for better understanding their desired outcomes? Yeah, that, that is a good one. And it, it, yeah, it, it, it is difficult. There, there are a couple of ways. One is, if you can stratify your users into different types of users, you can begin to understand groups of users. In some organizations, you can start forming user groups. So, uh, uh, so if users are using a particular application to do a particular thing, uh, you, can, you can form or they can form their own group or you can form a group to just talk about the issues they have, how they find it working. But the other thing you can do is if you have a large group of users, choose some at random, call them and try and talk to them and ask them. You know, if, 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 if you have no idea how all of your users work and you see some users standing out because they have more incidents and issues than others, have somebody call them up, somebody like a business analyst and saying, you know, what is it that you're finding isn't working? How, what would it would be the ideal for you? What are you trying to do with this? Get those answers back and start trying to understand how general they are. Uh, again, you, you may have a situation where you've got thousands of users and they're all different, but that's actually quite unusual. Normally, they'll fall into broad groups and you can detect them from the type of issues you have, but then go out and contact them. Have business analysts talk to them, maybe little focus groups of people who seem to have similar issues. Uh, I mean, these days you can have a focus group online. It didn't take very much time. But just to talk about what are the things that really cause you hassle? What are the things that are make you unhappy about your experience? What could be done to make it better? And it'll take time. These things do take time. But if you have a concerted effort of trying to learn from your user community and then use what you've learned in order to improve your service, you'll find that you will have quite rapid improvement. And that will encourage you to spend more on doing that activity. There's a follow-up question to that. Yep. So based on your answer, the support agents need to monitor the user group forums to better understand their issues and desired outcomes. Is that right? Yes, not necessarily the service desk agents themselves, because they're under a lot of pressure already with you know doing the work. But what could be useful is to get people who are working offline, maybe second level support, maybe problem management, technical people, to go through those user group forums and try and digest from them. And then take that digest back to the service desk agents and talk about it. This is what they're talking about. These have been some issues. Uh, I think to ask service desk agents to get you know fully engaged with uh, all of the user group forums could be quite an overhead. So yeah, um, it's it, that. This is really part of knowledge management. And with knowledge management, you you want to have people responsible for uh, pruning it. You know, pulling out what the important messages are and trying to communicate those messages. Expecting everybody to do that, I, I don't think that would be such a good scheme. I mean, if they're interested and, and you know, that it's a small user group and they've got a very niche product, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying taking that as your standard approach is, is uh, I think, putting too much of a burden on, on the service desk. Uh, having it as part of your knowledge management uh, function would work better, I think. Perfect. Um. Here's another one. Um, moving away from customer satisfaction type questions, can you give an example of a couple of good user and customer experience questions? <laughs> user and customer metrics. <laughs> um, well, the measure of experience is how do you feel? It's as simple as that, really. And the only way you can find out how somebody feels is to ask them. So. The, the best metric for a good customer experience, good customer journey, is not to give people huge forms to fill in, 
but every now and again contact particular select groups and ask them how was it for you what was the experience like as an open-ended question not did we do it in this time did we do it in that time but how is the service for you and encourage them to talk to you and you can then use that information uh, to build up a picture of where people are unhappy um, as I said, there, there, there might be some direct ways of measuring that. If you measure phone calls and listen to the level of stress and you find out whenever people phone up with a particular type of incident, they are really upset and the computer spots it, that, that I mean, is a fairly direct way of doing it. But the technology is very new and you have ethical issues and so forth. Generally, the only way you can have a good metric for experience is asking people. And it may not be asking it on the same day. You may want to ask a week later because often uh, the experience is not just the experience of the incident, the call, it's how it contributed to their work over the remaining week. So you dealt with us last week, we helped you with this, how did it help the rest of your week? And if the answer is, well, I don't even remember it, well, okay, at least I didn't remember a bad thing. But if the answer is, well, I was really pleased because they taught me something new, I was able to use it and it's now helping me and and brilliant, that, that's what you're trying to achieve. So open-ended interviews fairly often but not with the same person you start to annoy people if you ask them too often so choose a few of your customers at random uh, each week a few of your users at random each week and just have an open-ended discussion with them you need somebody who's very good at doing that sort of thing you need someone who, who um you know is is, is uh, uh, lots of emotional intelligence some of the skills of business analysis to understand what's being said about requirements and also a good manner to work 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 with customers um, but yeah, if, if you do that well, that, that's how I'd recommend uh, measuring it. It's not an automated matter, it's a, it's a human matter. Okay, we have a lot of questions coming in. Okay. Um, do you have any advice for organizations that are experiencing work volume and staffing pressures with regards to which areas are most critical to work on if you are very limited with time and resource? It's a good question. The most obvious place to work, the reason people are normally under most pressure is that you're not giving enough time to problem management. So you've got lots of repeated incidents. If you have lots of repeated incidents, take time out, force people to stop dealing with just incident management and look at the underlying reasons why things are happening and fix them so you can reduce the number of things. Organizations that are too busy to do problem management will always be too busy to do problem management because they haven't got problem management to reduce the workload. So that's the first answer. The bigger answer is what it's, the question really is about capacity management. Capacity management is understanding what the demand is and what you need in terms of resources to fix that demand. Now, again, one of the issues you have is if you have a really busy service desk with very few resources and not very much money, not only are you not going to be doing problem management, but you're going to have high staff turnover because people aren't going to enjoy it there. So what you really have to do then is to make a business case based on capacity for increasing the funding because the business needs to understand that it is actually causing a loss of value. They need to understand they need to invest more in order to reduce staff turnover, improve staff satisfaction, and that way reduce the uh, impact on other people and spend money on problem management, of course, to stop those repetitive incidents coming in. So it's a multifactorial answer. The first, very first step is, is get some problem management done. That's a kind of emergency fix. Next step is understand the capacity. And the third step is have a business case, a proper business case to the organization to transform the service desk into the sort of thing I've been talking about. Okay. Um, how does the ticketing tool behave in a multi-vendor environment? Well, um, <laughs> That's a very open question, and it depends very much on the tool that you've got, and it depends on what kind of multi-vendor environment you've got. But I think the way I'd answer it is that if you do have a, a very large multi-vendor environment and you are having trouble with incident management, what I would do is to get somebody to come in and, come in and talk to you about SIAM, Service Integration and Management. 
because Siam is a way of understanding your different suppliers and working out how to integrate the different services seamlessly so they all work together. And part of that integration should be working out how to integrate your incident management and your problem management and your improvement. So I'd say the big picture improvement that you need for a, a difficult multi-vendor situation is SIAM. And it's a whole discipline on its own. If you look up SIAM, you'll see that there are lots of books and advice and training courses on how to do it. And the, the aim of it is to get a grip of all of your suppliers and, and different vendors. It, it's a big job. It's, it, it, you, you won't do it in five minutes. And I'm sure if you're asking the question, uh, you, you weren't expecting an easy answer. Um, but Siam is the answer because it does uh, help you integrate and manage things better as a single service and help your um, support to work better. OK. Um, if you propose measuring support agent stress by analyzing the voice, couldn't you do the same for the users? Yes, you can. Uh, and and uh, I mean, I, I like the idea. I, I think it's great. And as, as long as you use it for the right reason, in other words, not, not to, uh, th th there are ethical issues about privacy and so on, and you need to deal with those. You need to think about them. But if your customers are comfortable with it and your users are comfortable with it, definitely. And if you, I, I mean, it, it would be a nice thing to do because what you'd like in your perfect environment is when somebody calls and you measure their stress levels, you expect them to be high. Um, when they finish the call, if you've done a good job, you expect, expect them to be lower. And if that's your, your pattern, you're doing, doing well. If the pattern's the other way around, people call and they get angrier, well, you know, you're going the wrong way. But you would probably need to be careful to anonymize these to make sure you weren't trying to target particular people, and you certainly shouldn't give anyone the target of improving the voice quality over a call. I mean, the, the trouble, and one of the big problems with metrics is that people start turning them into measures of people's performance. And then people try to meet the metric instead of trying to uh, work to do the right thing. And so uh, one of the big dangers of doing that would be if you started saying, well, this particular person is not doing a good job in reducing the level of stress. Uh, though, having said that, if you, everyone was happy with it and you found somebody wasn't, you might find that training in telephone technique, training in emotional intelligence, there could be all sorts of things that might be able to really help with that process. So, yeah, I uh, tread cautiously, but I think it's a very good idea myself. So there's a comment from Trevor. Um, I have come into what I call a legacy service desk internal to the org of 600 users. They have no processes at all, and I feel like I'm starting from scratch with regards to IDSM. No meaningful metrics. Uh, four first-line staff, three have been here from 20 to 30 years. Call volumes are high. Where on earth do I start? Users I have talked to just moan about IT, and they have the product, but they have ME, but it's not properly configured. So Trevor, I'm going to uh, ask our support team to get in touch with you with regards Good to idea. the last part of the uh, question. Uh, Trevor, if you uh, sorry, um, Peter, if there's anything you'd like to add to this, please feel free to. Well, yeah, I, I think that's right. You, you need someone to come in, come, come in to help. I, and I think that's a really good idea. Um, uh, but. I, it is very difficult. I've worked in situations moving from that in, 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 into a bad situation. You've got to take it a step at a time, like as ITIL does. Try and find the biggest area of pain. And if you've got a huge number of incidents, a lot of repeating, it may be problem management. So getting somebody in to do some problem management for maybe just two or three months might reduce a lot of the workload. And once you can reduce the workload, then you can start looking at fixing the other fundamental problems. But th that probably needs to be the first thing you need to do. Look at that overall workload and see what can be done to actually manage this down. Because again, if you reduce the workload, you can increase the time that you spend with your customers and start the virtuous circle goes going. But yeah, that's what I'd say. First job is how can we reduce that workload? It may even help. And, and I, I, you, if you're getting advice from someone else, you know, they'll, they'll have better suggestions to uh, hire more temporary staff, you know, maybe for three or four months to stand in and work 
at your service desk dealing with incidents while you take your staff into the background to work on underlying problems, uh, processes, and other things. You know, you have to be quite inventive um, with it. But the, the first step, definitely get some advice. I think that's a, a good idea. Okay, thank you so much, Peter. I think that's all the questions we have. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thank you for those questions. They're really good, uh, interesting questions. So uh, it, it made it uh, interesting. And I hope everyone's found it uh, useful and interesting. Yeah, so with that, I think we can close the session. There's one chat. Let me... Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you all so much for joining in. Thank you, Peter, for... Uh, Thank for you. all of your thoughts and for sharing all of your uh, expertise and experiences with us. And I'm sure that you know, everybody benefited from it. So thank you once again. And thank you, everyone, for joining in. We will see you again in another webinar some other time. <laughs> <laughs> Take okay. it. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.